Welcome to Journaling with Nature, the podcast for those who want to turn curiosity into wonder, a pencil sketch into a rabbit hole of discovery, a moment of stillness into a life full of joy. I'm your host, Bethan Burton. Let's open the pages of our nature journals and explore this world together. Hello, this is episode 99. Today's guest is artist, writer and instructor Sandy McDermott. Sandy describes herself as a New England artist exploring Alaska. In our conversation, you'll hear all about Sandy's adventures and the ways that her nature journal is helping her understand the Alaskan landscape. Let's listen. Sandy, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Oh man, I am so excited and grateful to be here. Thank you. This is going to be fun. Yeah. So I would love to know about nature in your childhood. Has nature been with you from the beginning? Uh, Yes, Uh, although um, as a really young person, I grew up in the city of uh, Cambridge and then that extended into Boston and uh, Massachusetts. And uh, when I was really young, I knew that I knew that nature was something I was interested in, but I was not cognitive that way. I couldn't articulate it. Mm -hmm. Um, So I thought that, and being in the city, I thought that my, I thought that the only way I could connect to it was through television, television programs like, uh, Mm -hmm. Some people might remember Grizzly Adams, this really Mm -hmm. old show. Um, The um, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom was a favorite show. And then um, books. And one one strong memory I have is an encyclopedia set that someone had given to me. It could have been my parents. And I read everything cover to cover. I would not have retained it all, but I just remember being absolutely glued to uh, to that encyclopedia and tried to. I was just engrossed with it. Um, but that was the extent of what I thought I could, uh, or how I thought I could connect to it. Mm-mm. And tell me about creativity in your childhood. You you wrote on your website about this memory of. <laughs> Your first creativity and entering a, a design competition at the school library. Do you want to tell that story? Yeah, yeah. That's actually one of my oldest memories too. And probably I'd forgotten about it for a long time and still until I uh, really sat down and started thinking about my path. Um, so, I mean, as a, again, going back to being a young person, um, making art was always something I was attracted to. And uh, it could be, you know, crayons, markers, all that kind of stuff that kids love to use, coloring books, paint by number. Um, and um, so that kept me entertained for a long time. But the one, the first memory I have of, and uh, how I state it in, on my website, is the first memory I have of making art that mattered uh, to Mm -hmm. me was entering a competition through this public school library, the school that I had been attending. um, And it was a a bookmark contest. So I decided to enter it and I made an image with crayons on construction paper of Dr. Doolittle and his uh, little collection of animals around him. (laughs) And, um, you know, I, it was just so much fun to do that and to have some sort of that, that was probably the first time I had any kind of guidance on what to do prior to that. It was just all whatever I want to draw or paint. Uh, and it felt really good because I won first place. (laughs) (laughs) So that triggered something in me way back then. Yeah, and significant that it was animals and wildlife Mm -hmm. because that was a little glimpse into what was to come. Exactly, yeah. And you wrote a really heartfelt and personal article for the Guild of Natural Science Illustrators where you talked about your evolution as an artist and you used the term bushwhack Mm -hmm. to describe the way that you found your path through life. And Mm -hmm. I'd love for you to expand on this metaphor of bushwhacking. Yeah, yeah. That that word came to mind as I began writing that article. So my upbringing was uh, not filled with nurturing and 
you know, guidance and the kinds of things that you might expect from parents. Uh, and that's no criticism on my parents. It was just their own circumstances. And so, you know, having access to art materials and winning a few competitions in elementary school, that was sort of the start of my path, except I didn't realize it then, and I didn't realize that I could make something from this, particularly connecting my um, deep interests in art and in, um, at the time it was mostly animals, but over time I realized it was all of natural history that I was very much interested in. And so as I was writing the article, um, what came to my mind was that I had to find my own path. I had to take all kinds of steps, and many of them were in wrong directions, uh, to find my way, to finally realizing how I could put together natural history and, um, and art. So bushwhacking really is how it felt for so many years and in, in many different circumstances. Um, I had, once I, so when I finished high school, I had no intentions of going on to college. I just didn't have a good high school experience. I didn't, hmm. you know, it, 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 and there was lots of reasons for that. Um, and a lot of it was my own, my own lack of interest. Uh, so I ended up taking five years off after high school. And those were critical years for me. And I didn't know that that was going to be the case, but they really were. Uh, I was able to break away from some old habits and find my way into new stuff and find the courage to take my first art class ever. I've never, I never took any art classes um, prior to that. And so, you know, very slowly taking steps towards finding, bushwhacking, finding, finding my way <laughs> through this forest of, of unknowns to me. And uh, so got into college, you know, I found my way to college, got the courage to, to go. Um, and over a five year period of college, I went back and forth between majoring in art and majoring in science. I flipped back and forth. There was one year where I double majored. And in the end, I was like, art is the thing. Like, that's mm -hmm. really where I feel like I'm going to maintain it, um, interest enough to uh, last a full career. But it was in my sophomore year, I think, um, where I was taking a class in uh, comparative anatomy and, of course, using lab manuals. And it was the first time I, I noticed that everything was hand-drawn in, in, in that anatomical things. Um, and it just suddenly dawned on me, wait a minute, somebody's drawing this. Mm. <laughs> How do I get to do that? So that was another kind of a, um, you know, I bushwhacked my way through college trying to figure things out. And uh, along the way, little light bulbs came on or a little clearing in the path and, and then started, you know, changed my direction, started um, giving me a, a place to, to keep working towards. So, um, you know, fast forward to now, uh, 30 years later, as a professional, I can say that bushwhacking still at times feels like that's what I'm doing, um, but not nearly as much as those many years ago, formative years trying to find my way. So bushwhacking really, be, I feel, I still feel like that, that fits very much what um, kind of journey I, I had in getting to where I am. I love this metaphor because it, it says so much and so many of us, you know, there's a, the rare few who sort of were born knowing what they wanted to do and how to get there and so many of us just make our way through and it only makes sense in hindsight when we're looking back over the trajectory of our lives yeah. and bushwhacking just such a very descriptive way of, of talking about this phenomenon. And yeah. I, I'm interested because you mentioned something about having difficulty owning the title or owning the the oh, word artist yeah. <laughs> and I've I struggled with this myself even when I was making art every day I would say I make art but I 
I couldn't say that I was an artist. And and I'm interested in your story about that and how you came to make peace with owning that label. That story might make me a little teary at, so, at some point. So yeah. forgive me. I, I'll apologize ahead of time. Um, so g- going back to my upbringing and not being in a very nurturing um, environment, you, you grow up. I, I, I think a lot of people can relate to that, uh, to this, that you, you grow up with a certain lack of confidence. Mm. And that level of confidence can certainly vary from one person to another. Uh, I think that much of it is also rooted in your own DNA. You know, mm. someone who sure. grew up in my circumstance might um, have come out with no lack of, with full confidence, with, you know, Mm -hmm, still mm -hmm. being able to um, carry on with whatever uh, directions they want to take. But in my case, uh, it certainly led to a lack of uh, confidence. And, you know, the the environment outside of my home that I grew up in was also not a, a, a very nurturing one as well. So I definitely grew up with a lack of confidence. And Mm. I don't know how or why I developed a very specific image of what an artist is. <laughs> uh, I Honestly, I don't know where that comes from. But I think in hindsight, I can say I think that um, it was there f- for whatever reason. And between the two things, and, and I think the fact that um, it's taken me a very long time to get to where I am now, and of course there's all kinds of other reasons involved in that, but the combination set me up for not feeling quite like the professional I had prepared myself to be, mm-hmm. not having full identity with either being an artist or being a naturalist, and I'd been working so hard at being both on a professional level. So there was, um, there was this one day I was feeling especially bad about it. And my husband is the one who he, he, he spread out, he dug up a whole bunch of my art sort of over time from college up through that present time. This is some years ago. Mm-hmm. And he literally took me by the hand and walked oh. me through all of these pieces and helped me to understand that I am, that I am what I intended for myself to be. It's just other circumstances have held me back and and I'm not using any of that as a crutch. It's just, it's just how I felt at the time. And I mm-hmm. honest, I don't mind sharing this with people because, again, I really feel like a, there's a lot of people out there that can identify with that and with the whole path that I have been on. Um, so that really was a pivotal moment for me in realizing, as he put it, I've boxed myself into, I had boxed myself into this identity that really wasn't necessary, that it really just, all I needed was to step outside of that box and be authentic about who I am and what I'm doing and, um, and to keep pursuing it. That story brings a tear to my (laughs) eye as well. I I feel like it's, it's so... Oh, it's such a blessing when we have someone who sees us mm-hmm. in a way that we can't see ourselves and to hold a mirror up and to say, look, look what you are. Yeah. That's, that's a really special story. It's, it's a gift. It is a gift. And I bet that your experience with self-doubt and lack of confidence has helped you be a better teacher when people come, when students come to your workshops with the same struggles. Do you, do you find that your experience helps you be a better teacher? It, it absolutely does. Um, I, so my teaching style is one that fosters a safe environment. Um, that's a priority for me. And what I mean by that is I know that there are lots of people who come to my classes 
feeling, um, having that same kind of lack of confidence. They might not be professionals. They might not, you know, this, this might be just something they want to try. Or, or like me, they knew they had interest in both nature and art and want to give it a shot to see what they can do with it. Uh, people who have well, retirees who who were artists in college that's what they went to school for but ended up not making a career out of it you know people coming back to it all, there's all kinds of individuals and in, in reasons why people would come um, but so recognizing the sensitive um, the sensitive nature of making yourself vulnerable with trying something yeah. new or trying to do something well that, that you never really felt like you could is really important to me. So I, that's a priority. And I put this into my documents that I do create a safe environment to, to mm -hmm. let yourself explore, to let yourself play and, um, and go from there. And the other thing that I foster is a sense of community within my classes mm -hmm. so that people who do come to it, I, I don't, I can't ever always know what kind of personality that is coming to the class. But as we get going, I make it very clear that um, participation is important as a peer. So mm -hmm. when I have critiques, I don't just sit there and, you know, go through everybody's work and make comments about them on my own. It's a community thing. And um, I think that's another thing that makes others feel safe when they know the person next to them is admiring some part of what they just did. Yes. That goes a long way. That's wonderful. So as a natural science illustrator, a lot of your work is actually in the field spending time with plants and animals, sketching, getting to know them. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering about nature journaling specifically as, as different from nature illustration mm -hmm. and nature journaling as a tool for coming to know an organism and how much of a part of your practice that might be. Hey, right now it's a huge part of my practice. Um, mm -hmm. So over the 30 years, probably 24, Five, maybe a little bit more than that years ago um, is when I started trying to uh, add teaching to my my professional list mm -hmm. and um, I over time got much better at it uh, with the help of uh, Claire Walker Leslie she was somebody who she's this is another kind of fun story uh, ironic um, she as you know, she lives in Cambridge and she goes She's between from Cambridge and Vermont. Mm -hmm. Yes. I had no idea. I didn't know. I mean, of course, I didn't even know when I was in Cambridge what what any of this is. Uh, it just was not on my radar at all. Mm -hmm. But um, so it was in it was in graduate school in California that I was introduced to her work and we used her book, The Art of Field Sketching. So that that was piv another pivotal moment in my career path was uh, being connected to her work. And way back then, I promised myself if I ever move back to the East Coast, I am going to seek her out just to just to meet her. And yes. of course, I did. I did end up doing that. Um, and we formed a mentor relationship. Wow. Yeah, she she really did um, help me to get started with teaching and we maintain that for a little while and then um then over time this i'm sorry this is the long way of answering your question but no it, perfect. It's, it's relatable <laughs> uh over time that mentor relationship became more of a colleague uh relationship and then and and now and for some years now um we've considered each other good friends so um how this relates to your question is Field sketching or keeping a nature journal has always been a part of my work. It's always been a critical piece to it and, real, and probably the most important piece to my mm. soul. And mm. uh, But there's there were long periods of time where um, my husband and I were raising our daughter and yeah. uh, I needed to bring in some income so I would have to work an office job or some art, uh, some job not related to art. And so whatever extra time I had left over, 
I, I committed to continuing my teaching. And I think at the time, in hindsight, I think that was a, a really wise decision. Um, so all those years of those years of uh, teaching and not really making too much art except for the occasional um, illustration project, um, that kept me connected to my work as a profession, uh, a professional. Um, but whenever I could, I would get back to my sketchbook and make sure I'm working in it. And I would take it with me wherever I go, even if I, you know, it was a, a day hike somewhere or um, just going to visit family. My sketchbook would always come with me and I wasn't always able to pull it out and use it on those occasions. But when I could, I did. And fast forward to now, having moved to Alaska to a place that is so overwhelming to my mind in terms of the landscape and in terms of a few frightening things that are here, <laughs> um, I, it took me a little time to figure out how I was going to negotiate that, those anxieties. And, mm -hmm. and I decided that my sketchbook is the way I have to do it. I have to explore here the natural history, um, with my sketchbook and that's my comfort place and that's how I'm introducing myself to the landscape and and finding ways to connect with it and say hello who are you <laughs> whether it's plant or animal and um it it definitely is helping me ease into this and and it's been well we've been here for a little over a year so I I still have a way to go to 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 really conquer some of these anxieties I have uh uh, but it's working. It's 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 really important to me now, and I'm building a whole project out of out of this experience as well. Um, and so that feels really good to have a direction here. Yeah. Okay. So I'm really keen and excited to talk to you about this experience uh, of moving to a new environment and how how you're getting to know it. I wonder, so you are originally from New England mm -hmm. and now living in Alaska. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could give a brief little um, description of the environment of your home and the envir and your new Alaskan environment. Sure. There's, um, the, the good thing is that there's, there's some, uh, there's a, actually a lot of similarities. So the weather, the climate is pretty similar. Back in New England, uh, I had been living in northern New England, so it gets pretty darn cold there. Um, <laughs> we do get sub-zero temperatures, and we can get lots of snow. Um, and it's the same here. This past winter was our first full winter here, and um, I was delighted that in terms of the climate, it was not that different. It's okay. just longer. <laughs> so <laughs> next month, you know, about a month from now, the peaks will start um, keeping the snow that falls on them. Okay. And by the end of September, first, you know, early October, we'll start getting snow here in the city. And, you know, like any place, that could change from year to year. It certainly does. But, um, that's the experience that I've had so far, and that's what people tell me is quite normal. Uh, a big difference is how much light there is. And, mm. of course, we knew this about Alaska before coming here. And so, you know, you mentally prepare for it as best you can without actually having experienced it. Um, and I can now say, after a full year here, that I acclimated to the long, dark winter better than I am acclimating to the long light summer Ooh, interesting <laughs> yeah so in some in terms of light in summer it stays the the sun will just sort of stay in the sky yeah so in, in anchorage particularly we on the summer solstice i think we have something like uh, um 22 and a half or 23 hours of wow. of sunlight of daylight that's incredible to me it is it really is <laughs> and what do you have to do in terms of cha changing your habits? Do you have to have blackout curtains just to get to sleep? Well, How do you manage it? Yeah, so um, blackout curtains do a great job, or blackout shades. And But in my case, um, because I have um, allergies, I have to sleep with a window open. So okay. it, there's lots of people I've talked to that have the same thing the same issue. So you have, that means you got to pull the shade away from the window a little bit to let that air mm -hmm. in. 
and and so it it's almost it it almost defeats the purpose of having blackout yeah. shades, but not completely. Yeah. Um, so in that, what I've been doing this year, and I refused to do it last year because I can be stubborn, but this year I adopted the practice of wearing an eye mask at night. Yep. To just And I actually, when I started doing that, I couldn't believe how much it helped. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So oh. the long light summers and I, you have to live by a clock, but, but yeah. what, um, what I understand locals do is they play hard all summer long, all it's, it's, it's like from mid spring to right about now, um, yeah. the days feel like they can last forever. You can go out after yeah. work and do a four hour hike. Um, <laughs> I just, I don't, I can't do that. I, I feel like I need, I need the clock so I can get to bed at a certain hour, do my best to have a full night's sleep yeah. and, and be ready for the next day. But they play hard all summer. And then when winter comes, there's still a lot of outdoor activities, but um, but locally people tend to sort of settle in for the long dark mm-hmm. winter. Yeah, yeah. So I was talking with another Alaskan, Kim McNett, and oh, yes. she was telling me about this seasonality and how they are f- frantically busy during mm-hmm. the spring and summer. And then they winding down mm-hmm. in the autumn, and then they almost sort of retreat into semi hibernation in winter yeah. and and rest and she needs that rest because they've been like you say playing hard all all through the summer yeah and to me that's just incredible i can't because here our our seasons are very mild mm-hmm. um we have evergreen um environments and so this idea that you would have such a strong seasonality and your year would be really rhythmic like that yeah. it there must be something really beautiful and like you have no choice but to go with nature yeah. because nature is dictating your the structure of your days yeah right? yeah so true and and in and in many other ways too um my day-to-day life has had to change tremendously so right now the bears that we have here, we have black bear and brown bear, uh, and the black bear are kind of move. most of them are kind of moving up into the hillsides um, to take advantage of the berry patches. That's a big source of food for them. While the brown bears are already at the streams uh, to pick off the salmon that's coming in because they rely on that quite a bit before winter comes. So uh, it's been sort of a berry year this year. My husband has had a number of encounters with black bears, not, not bad encounters. You learn, how to, you learn how to prepare for them. And this, this is truly one of my biggest anxieties of being here. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, I, so going for a hike for me is a very, um, very intense <laughs> idea whereas back home you know it yeah i'd go hiking every day if i could um it's it's rewiring my brain and after you know so many years of living in places that felt comfortable and right and normal you know for lack of better terms <laughs> yeah yeah uh being here is so different in a lot of ways that um I've re- definitely had to rewire my brain and I'm still working on that. I'm still figuring out my comfort level and I've actually gotten much more comfortable with the idea of being around bears. So I will go for a hike with just my husband. Whereas a year ago I had to have five other people with me to feel yeah. comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's getting better. It's definitely getting better. And I think that the more time I spend in the places that give me this anxiety, um, the quicker and easier I will acclimate to it. And you, you went on a bear tour recently, yeah. is yeah. that right? <laughs> tell, yeah. Tell me about that. Was it? Did you feel comfortable? I, I did. For the most part, I did. Uh, yeah. So we, we, my husband and I booked this back in January, and uh, along with um, booking a couple of uh, public use cabins. So these are cabins that are on public land that you can go and you know spend whatever amount of time and. And, and go adventure from those places. Um, and my, my, my requirement for public use cabins this year was, last year I was not going to do that. 
This mm-hmm. this year I said, okay, I'm going to do it, but we have to be able to drive and park at it. Like I'm not ready to hike sure. in four miles to the cabin. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and along the same lines, uh, I was ready to have a bear encounter, but under controlled circumstances yes. or yeah. as controlled as they could be. So, uh, so that's why we booked the Brown Bear Tour. And everything we've done this year has been a great success. It's really helped me um, desensitize. It's going to take me a little more time, but I'm getting there. And the Brown Bear Tour was, was just, um, it was incredible to be able to be within 150 yards of a wild Alaskan bear. Wow. And, um, you know, we learned some, some things about um, our own body language that, we had to pay attention to in in order to let the bear feel comfortable. And we learned some things about what to look for in the bear, um, in his behavior, his or her behavior to understand, okay, we, we need to change our behavior because you know, the bear is feeling uncomfortable. Interesting. Yeah. And fortunately we didn't, we didn't have a negative experience in any way at all. And, in uh, we were, so we, um, we booked through, um, a, tour group here and they flew us over to the Kenai um Kenai National Park I think it's called and uh our guides were our pilots um they were fabulous they were very confident they were very skillful and very knowledgeable and so that immediately put me at ease yes and um and then they took us to a couple of spots where they tend to find bears they know the area really well so they 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 know about the bears that are there and um the first the first instance was a couple of um blonde brown bears that they happen to be blonde in color instead of instead Mm. of brown and they were siblings uh about four years old and so we learned a bit about their history um and then after that occasion, we walked, um, hiked over to another area that um, had where this 900 pound alpha male was um, digging around, doing his th- bear thing. Uh, salmon was not in at in the creeks at that time, so he was still on berries and roots and grubs and stuff like that. Um, but he, um, we got to watch him for what felt like forever. And wow. with the, with the sibling blondies, I didn't have enough time to get my sketchbook out. Although I carried it with me. I carried, I asked the guy before, when we got out of the plane, I said, is it okay if I carry my sketchbook and my pen? Cause I didn't really know if, yeah, if that would be okay. So, um, he was like, yeah. And, and with a little bit of a question in his, in his response, like, why would you do that? <laughs> But um, so I did. I carried it everywhere we trudged along, and I didn't get to use it with the blondies, but I did get to use it with the the, the alpha male, whose name happens wow. to be Lippy, and uh, and that was amazing. That was absolutely amazing. So as our group was approaching the the um, Lippy, the brown bear, um, I did become pretty nervous, and my husband yeah. kind of hung on to me and said, "Just mm-hmm. stay behind me. Just stay next to me." Uh, so I did, and. We settled into a spot that might have been about 150 yards away, but um, and and then that because of our behavior, we were quiet and all of that. Um, Lippy was very comfortable moving towards us, um, but he wasn't coming to see us. He really wasn't paying attention to us at all. Sure, he was uh, moving across the grass and then dropped into a creek. Uh, it was a particularly hot day, um, much warmer than it should be here or it usually is. Mm. And so he was just looking for a place to rest and cool off. So he plopped into this Creek of water and, um, did his bear thing, tried to sleep for a bit, seemed a little restless, but he got some rest. And, and then, um, as he started to come up out of the Creek on our side, that's when we, as a group, our guides were like, okay, it's time for us to back, back away a little bit. So we did, and um, that time period might have only been 20 minutes that we got to mm-hmm. watch him, but it felt like forever for me. And I managed to get three pages of sketches done Amazing. out of it. And it really was. It was it was a great, great experience to help me feel better about being in that kind of environment and um, 
and get some sketches of wild bears. <laughs> I love it. I love that you're confronting these fears of your new environment and that the sketchbook is helping you do that, mm -hmm. helping you process and integrate yeah. these amazing but, you know, dangerous yeah. creatures into your life and lifestyle. Yeah, yep, yep. Um, it, yeah, it, the sketchbook is definitely helping me feel better about where I am physically. Yeah. Wow. So you do a lot of field sketching, of course, and I saw an, uh, I saw a blog post of yours where you had laid out all the tools mm -hmm. that you'd packed for different types of trips, <laughs> short trips and long trips. Yep. And I'm wondering about your tools and what are the tools that you can't live without, that you take on every trip and uh, the, your favorites that you take with you, where you wherever you go? Um, so I, I have a number of different kinds of sketchbooks. I, for many years, I used the B Company's um, Aqua B paper sketchbooks, and I've really enjoyed those for a long time. But over, uh, probably in the last decade, uh, maybe even just eight years or so, I, I've started incorporating um, a few other kinds of sketchbooks. And one of them is, I'm just going to reach over here to pull it out. Uh, so I can remember the name. It's a hardcover sketchbook. It comes in different sizes, and it's from the Handbook Journal Company. Oh, yeah, I saw this. In fact, you and I have a favorite um, sketchbook in common. I love this one. My favorite is the 8x8 square one. Yeah, I have one of those, yeah. I just love the paper. It's, like, not too thick, not too thin. You right. can watercolor on it. You can um, write easily. Yeah. I'm going to put I'm gonna put a link to that in the show notes for this episode oh, so people good. can check out. Oh, good, good. Yeah. It's, um, it's very durable, too. I mean, you know, I, I tend to favor wire-bound sketchbooks because of how they open up, uh, mm -hmm. and I can do two-page spreads. But um, this book can lie flat pretty nicely, and it is the paper quality really is quite nice it's not quite like you know an arches watercolor paper but it's mm -hmm. not intended to be that heavy anyway and yeah you can use uh ink graphite and watercolors on it and i i like the lance there's a small landscape size that i tend to use a pack for um when i need to keep my my uh sketching kit pretty light so there's that there's also another sketchbook I've been using this year um, for this project, which is the um, Pentalic Paper Company, and it, the book is called Nature Sketch. And, nice. And I, did, I didn't pick it up just because it says that. <laughs> the paper in it is actually um, even a little bit heavier than the Handbook Journal Company paper. Um, and I felt like, okay, I'm going to be carrying this around in a lot of different environments uh, that are new to me. And... I want something that is a little heavier. I'm going to give this a try. So that's been working out really well for me. That's also a wire-bound, soft-cover kind of book. And then there's one more that I became aware of just in the last few months, um, Etcher, E-T-C-H-R. Mm -hmm. And they're pricey. But I, you know, as a professional, one of the other things I like to do is be aware and be familiar with um, as many tools as possible so I can talk about them with students. Mm -hmm. And um, this book, because it's pricey, I will not use it. It's not for every day. <laughs> but the, um, the paper quality in it is absolutely delightful. Uh, it, some of these other sketchbooks I've used, the watercolors can dry way too quickly. And, mm. and I've learned how to adapt to that and work with it. But um, the Etcher sketchbook doesn't really have that problem, and you can work really wet in it, which is, um, it is a way that I like to use, and I have produced work in a very juicy, wet kind of way with lots of pigment, <laughs> but I've sort of, over time, for oh, I don't know what reasons, but I've kind of backed off of that and um, become a little more traditional with how I use the watercolors for, for natural science illustrations purposes. Uh, but I think the Etcher sketchbook is going to let me jump back into that and, mm -hmm. and work really nicely with it. So that's the sketchbook stuff. Um, I use, uh, oh gosh, the pencil company that I like. I've used so many different kinds of graphite pencils. And the one that I've landed on um, some years ago 
that I just, I can't go back to any other pencil. <laughs> it's the Tombow oh, um, yeah. graphite. I just love its, um, the way it feels going across the page. It has the perfect, it, for me, it has a perfect balance of, of um, softness and um, whatever the medium, is, the binding medium. It doesn't feel waxy at all. It's really, really nice. And then I do use um, the, this, everybody uses these, I think. Most people are familiar with the Micron, the Pigma Micron pens. They're uh, mm -hmm. archival, waterproof, and delightful. But um, towards the end of a cross-country bike trip that my husband and I did, I was in Bennington, Vermont with my daughter, who was, she was our, our um, what do you call it? She was our support van across the country on this bike wow. trip. Yeah, it was cool. <laughs> anyway, we, we, so we were in Bennington and I took a half day off from riding and we checked out a, an office supply store that happened to have a section for art materials. So I didn't, <laughs> I didn't expect very much, but it was, I was blown away. It was great. It was a great, um, great store. And I found the um, Pentel Arts Hybrid Technica pen. And these are mm -hmm. water soluble. Uh, but I absolutely love this pen and I use it far more than I do any other kind of pen. Okay. And then I have a That's set a good recommendation. Yeah. Um, uh, a couple of brushes that I have as favorites are um, I've been using for quite a while the size 16 black velvet paintbrush, which is a squirrel hair brush. And um, that's from, yeah, Black Velvet. Silver Black Velvet is the name of that. I have a set of travel brushes from them, which are really nice uh, to keep a kit small when you're traveling. I don't always carry the big brushes around with me. But being a vegetarian, um, I and being prompted by a student of mine who is a, also a vegetarian, I started looking into... Um, uh, I guess, uh, what do you call it? Um, synthetic brushes. Synthetic yeah. Brushes. Mm -hmm. And came across a couple that I was very surprised at how nice they are. Mm -hmm. And one of them is the es Escoda, E-S-C-O-D-A mm -hmm. Prado um, brush. That's been absolutely wonderful. And then the large brush I use that around 16 is from Princeton and it's just called Aqua Elite. So those two those are great recommendations. That, yeah. Um, and, you know, for anyone out there who is thinking along the same lines, um, what it really comes down to is where do you, you're either going to put your money in the animal fur industry or you're going to put it into the uh, petrochemical industry. Yes, it's a it's a conflict, isn't it? Yeah. I've, I've gone through this conflict myself. I haven't really made any sort of resolution or peace with it. But yeah, it is something yeah. to think about. Yeah. So that's most of my tools. Um, I have a, my watercolor paints. The pigments come from mostly Winsor Newton, but uh, mm -hmm. but not all. There's there's a Holbein and there's there's a Daily Rounder in there. Um, so there's but there's the the pigments I use are are I've been using for quite a while. i you know it takes a while to get used to what your pigments are going to do for you. Yes, and, and then it's hard to. Um, to switch to it switch up. To switch it up, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'd love to talk to you about getting to know watercolour as a medium. You've written about this and experimenting and immersing yourself in what you call purposeful play. Mm -hmm. And I love this term, and I'd love for you to describe what that means to you. What it means to me is changing your mindset on how to approach the learning process. Um, and it, of course, in this case, particularly with watercolor, but I use the term in all of my classes, no matter what technique we're working on. Um, purposeful play means allowing yourself that opportunity to let go of what the end result is every single time that you are sketching or painting or drawing. It means giving yourself some room and some grace to make mistakes uh, because you will not learn to master what you want to master unless you go through that phase. And, you know, I've heard it. I mean, 
you the 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 ways people encourage that um, are different. In you know classical learning, I think that it's simply put practice, practice, practice. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Practice makes better. But I th- mm-hmm. what really helped me as a teacher in being able to to find a way to encourage and really convince people that it's okay to play. Um, I, I wanted to, I wanted to have a different way to say it. And, and it just kind of came to mind, purposeful play, allowing yourself time to just play with a medium or with a technique until you feel comfortable with it. Um, but that play time is purposeful. So they, it just stuck. And so now I use it all the time. <laughs> I love it. And I think that um, as adults, we need to play. And oftentimes yeah. we don't allow ourselves that need. Yeah. And I think it's, I think it's wonderful. Yeah. It, and, I, and I think it's been effective. I mean, I still keep it in my own head because I can get caught up in trying to make things yes. right, especially because I'm sharing right now so much of the um, project I'm working on. But it really has been effective for a lot of folks to sort of relax and feel like, yeah, yes. yeah, playtime. Okay, I can dig that. I can get behind that. It, nothing has to come out right right away. <laughs> so, yeah, I absolutely. think it works. <laughs> so I'd love to talk to you about mindfulness mm-hmm. and mindfulness in nature and how you experience that. Um, and you have a year-long workshop field sketching a year of mindfulness. I'd love to hear all about that, your experience of mindfulness in nature and and your workshop. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, So first of all, mindfulness, that always, that was not always um, a term that drove what I do. Um, It's really only been in recent years that I've made a connection on my own to what field sketching and nature journaling do for me, do for my peace of mind and for my, literally for my soul to be happy. Um, as a professional trying to, uh, make a business out of what I do as a freelance person, there's so much involved in that process. So I'm not always out sketching. I'm not always making art. Um, a good deal of my time is uh, creating opportunities for others to do that, which yeah. is, which is the teaching part. But but of course, like any business, there's all the different hats that you have to wear administratively um, that take up time. So I can very vividly recall a, t- a time period where I'd be so caught up with all of these other things and not devoting time to myself that... Um, I would literally just have to stop everything, grab my sketchbook and go somewhere. And the the last place we lived before here in Alaska was northern New Hampshire in the mountains. And I did find a spot there that I felt very comfortable um, just sitting in, just just Mm -hmm. being in that space. It was a, a pond that was actually intersected by a road, unfortunately, but um there were two sides of this pond and very often two, they felt like two different habitats. So I could look one way and get into what's happening there and I can turn myself around and go across the street and look at the other direction and find other things. Before that, before living in Northern New Hampshire, we lived in Southern, Southeastern New Hampshire near the coast. And there was a spot there that I eventually um, found my way to and felt very comfortable being alone in the woods. Um, and that provided the same sort of thing. So I would go to these places and, and I knew that, you know, it it was twofold. It was to, to keep learning about what's happening in those habitats. But, but on many occasions, the more important piece to it was finding some peace for myself because I was stressed out about this or that or whatever. And so, um, that's when I started to realize the mindfulness quality of, what nature journaling does for me. It just, it puts me, and I know it puts many other people um, into a really nice space from, for the brain. <laughs> and and if yeah. your brain can be happy, then the, then the rest of you tends to follow along. Yes, yes. So 
I developed um, as part of the whole pivoting thing with uh, COVID and not being able to do in-person classes uh, and be, so being forced to find a way to keep teaching, um, learning the whole landscape and the whole platforms and all of the logistical stuff that goes along with teaching online led me, and, and actually the move to Alaska was another thing that helped me um, realize what I could do from here. Um, after spending, you know, more than 20 years developing a, a list of clients and a list of students and making a name for myself locally in back in New England, I knew when we moved here to Alaska, I was not going to try to repeat that. That was a lot of years of work. Um, and I, it just was, I had no interest in trying to do that all over again in, in mm -hmm. such a faraway place. So I knew that if I was going to keep teaching, it has to be digitally. And um, as part of this project that I'm doing right now in my sketchbook, the course sort of came out of that as a side product. So I decided that I was going to try to teach a year-long course that, uh, we, that I'm calling Field Sketching, A Year of Mindfulness. There's a lot of people out there who have time commitment issues, and um, I thought that this would be a way to help them commit because they don't have to drive anywhere. You know, the time mm -hmm. commitment is less. But what, we're, what I'm doing with students is teaching them from day one observation skills. Um, it, you know, it's like a, what a lot of other instructors are doing, and I've been doing this for years. Uh, observation skills, connecting with nature, connecting with their own environment um, and and this is in a nutshell but as a byproduct um, that mindfulness quality getting people to understand that this is not only beneficial to uh, your relationship to the natural world and of course a benefit to the natural world the more of us that are aware of it and connected to it um, the better but it's also a healthful benefit it you know, it lowers your blood pressure. It um, helps you to be relaxed. It helps you, your, like I said, it, it changes your brain. It changes how you perceive your moment, uh, your environment in that moment. So it ha that piece of nature journaling has become very important to me. And, um, and I know it is, um, once people understand that as a byproduct, it becomes very important to them too. And it, it can be, as it had become for me, it can be a driver in making that commitment to yourself to keep doing this thing, this practice that, that, um, that you enjoy so much, but like life gets crazy, life gets busy and it's, it's hard. And, and that's something I totally understand. So it's been, I've, I'm wrapping up the first year of it, um, mm -hmm. and it's been, how I'm explaining it is it's been um, a little experimental, but fabulously gratifying. For, for, for right now I have, this year I just had five students, uh, because mm -hmm. it was new and I kind of wanted to feel my way through it and explore what this could be. Yeah, fabulously gratifying on so many levels, and, um, and I'm just gearing up now to um, curate the next cohort of students because I'm it, I'm going to do it again. And I, I really believe that there's a niche for this to reach out to people who can't come together in one place. I don't yes. think there's a year-long course um, virtual like this anywhere that's really addressing the beginner and intermediate um, artist, naturalist type of personality and um, bringing them step by step through an entire year of seasons, addressing observation and drawing skills along with uh, what's happening in your environment. So I'll give assignments that relate to the season. What can you find? You know, let's talk about the, the, um, the twigs on a tree in winter because that's something that can actually be quite informative. Yeah, that's wonderful that you're helping people make a commitment not only to their art and their connection with nature, but also just that 
stillness within them that we all need yeah. more and more as the as the pace of life yeah. speeds up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I would love to talk to you about birds because birds are an important theme in your work mm -hmm. and a, an important part of your project, your mm -hmm. current project that you've alluded to. Yeah. Um, so you have written that you didn't have a spark bird and a spark bird <laughs> is, uh, for those who don't know, um, the bird that gets you excited and interested in being a birder. Um, you write that you had a summer long spark experience and I'd love for you to talk about this spark experience and then about your current project involving birds. Sure. Um, gosh, I can't actually remember how long ago that was, but I'm going to say maybe about a decade ago, maybe a little bit longer. Um, I, oh, you know what? That's not true. I'm going to go way back. There was a time in my history, um, really long, like probably a couple decades ago where I knew this was after graduate school and I had been working for a few years, uh, I knew that birds were something I was really had, I was becoming very interested in. And mm. um, I was like a lot of folks, I was really intimidated by the idea of drawing them from life because mm -hmm. of their inherent nature of being so quick. They're, you know, flashes <laughs> of color and shape. And how do you deal with that? And I took my own advice, because um, I had been teaching for a little while, um, I took my own advice and said, I'm never going to learn if I don't start trying. Like, everybody has a starting point, and I have to allow myself that starting point. So, um, so I did. And so for a lot of years, my sketches of birds were just these, what I call chicken scratch marks on a page, <laughs> because it might be the shape of a wing, or the shape of a bill, or, you know the curve of a head, the crown of the head. Uh, but eventually allowing myself to continue to practice this way, purposeful play, I yes. was able to, uh, you know, not only was, well, because I was observing them as much as I was, I was building up a storage of information on shapes and colors. Um, and so I got better at putting body parts together in a quicker way. And this is always done with gesture sketching and blind contour. And sometimes mm -hmm. the two of them together, because mm -hmm. you're watching a bird move and you yep. don't want to look at your page. You only want to look at the bird. <laughs> but again, I just keep practicing this way, purposeful play, letting myself have that starting point and progressing. And as a teacher, I was very comfortable with sharing this process and sharing the stuff in my book that, you know, to the unknown eye, would not look like anything at all, but being able to explain to them, and because I'm writing in the book at the same time, as a way to help me remember what I was looking at, um, I was able to share that with other folks and encourage them that you, you know, just you can do this. Everybody has a starting point. Let yourself have that starting point. Give yourself that gift. And yes. um, so, you know, fast forward to now, and I'm still working at it. Um, I have a much better understanding of bird shapes, but there there was that one summer where I was doing um, a project for a local organization, a nonprofit, one of the Audubon prop, um, organizations, and I was doing a, a, some field research for them, which I was terribly excited about because until then I had never imagined I could do that and or would have the opportunity to. But um, it, it was amazing how many different species I was able to um, come across and observe and spend a little time with, interact, interact with from a visual sense, not, not certainly mm -hmm. not in a, like I wasn't holding out crumbs in my hand to attract them. Um, I, had, I had what I would now call a sit spot, but as a researcher, you wouldn't call it a sit spot. Mm -hmm. It was a zone mm -hmm. that I was required to um, record what I saw and heard within a certain radius over a certain amount of time. And I would do this repeatedly. So pretty much every week I was going out to this spot and, and you know, documenting, recording what I saw and heard. Uh, that was allowing me to see so many more species of birds getting used to um, a particular area, small area that um, over the summer what was happening in that space from 
probably the middle of nesting season all the way to when the birds were taking off. So I, you know, one memorable moment was uh, watching a family of Phoebes and the parents were teaching the fledglings to hunt on their own, to do that hawking wow. motion of uh, capturing insects in flight. So I would say that that summer was, was the spark summer. Uh, not mm -hmm. any one particular bird, but a month, you know, a, couple, a few months experience of being yeah. with the birds that really, yep. really got me hooked. Wow. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And tell me about the project that you're doing now that, that you're involved with in Alaska. Yeah. So oh, since that summer, I continued to keep learning about birds. Um, and oh, I can't remember how long ago. Um, but I came across the book from I'm, a lot of your listeners will probably know, Living on the Wing. Um, and I have it behind me. I totally am blanking on the author's name. Um, if I remember it, I'll shout it out. But uh, a fabulous book about bird migration. Mm -hmm. And having that summer with the birds and starting to form this more deeper understanding of, of what they're doing and what what their um, DNA is telling them to do by coming from the South or wherever and going somewhere else. I wanted to learn more about the migration. And as I learn about birds, it's I don't want to just know their name. I want to know where they're coming from. I want to know where they're yes. going and what they encounter over that time period. And so um, living on the, on the wing was, um, oh, Widensall, Scott Widensall, that's his name. Um, he is a fabulous writer. Uh, this book is about bird migration. It was written a little over 20 years ago, and it just reeled me in from the start and has me entirely engrossed in the phenomena of bird migration. So um, I've been approaching birding with that in mind, and I still have a long way to go with my field ID skills, you know, field ornithology. I have, I still have a long way to go, but I'm putting more time into it now, and um, hopefully we'll ad see advancement in a in a quicker way. But the project I'm working on is well, there's actually kind of two that might come out of this. Um, so right now, I'm I have a year-long project that is devoted to my sketchbook and learning about this new place that I'm living in, which is now a year in, not so new, but. It does take a while to get used to a place that Absolutely. you're not used to. So, um, but I'm using my sketchbook as a way to do that. And from a very emotional standpoint as well, you know, the, the anxieties that I've experienced here mm. uh, have been very real. And mm. I've had to find ways to navigate those because I'm not leaving. I might not, I'm, I might go back and forth to New England um, a little more frequently than than I thought I would, but um, it is an incredible place to be and so much to learn. So I'm using my sketchbook to do that. And I want to make a book, I intend to publish a book uh, from that experience. Um, I like, from, for me, I like the idea of continuing what I've always been doing, which is authentically sharing my own emotions about stuff, about, you know, about the mindfulness, the, the, the way that um, allowing myself to find that confidence, allowing myself to eventually understand I am an artist, <laughs> and it was just all in my head. I mean, all of yeah. this stuff plays <laughs> into what I'm doing right now. So um, I'm seven months into that project. Uh, I have a um, private newsletter list that I send out a sketch from my sketchbook every month. And um, what I choose to share with that list is something that I will not share with anyone else. So mm -hmm. the, the folks that are on this list receive a piece of art that, um, that I'm not sharing anywhere else, only with them. Wonderful. And they're pieces that I uh, plan to put forth into the book. Um, and um, part of that, part of what got me excited eventually got me really excited about being here is I realized the opportunity as a birder, most everything I've learned as a birder comes from uh, New England. Mm -hmm. However, I have lived on the West Coast for a while. Um, I have driven across the country six times. I've ridden across <laughs> the country once on a bike. 
And <laughs> all of that has allowed me to learn more about the um, just the broader landscape of the birds, being able to actually see places where they go in, uh, in the summer. And it all hinges to that whole migration phenomena. So there, although there hasn't been an emphasis on birds yet in my current project, um, there will be. And as another project, I am, intend to write a book about um, bird migration, but I want to format it in a different way than the traditional field ID books, which always go by taxonomy or family groups. Mm -hmm. uh, they all felt follow that same pattern. And as an artist, and the way I think, and the way I want to learn, um, I want to know the flyways. I want to know what birds go up, which flyway, where are they coming from, where are they going to go, when can you, knowing that there can be changes from year to year, especially now with climate change being so prevalent, um, the information may change a bit. So there's a lot of things that I have to go into thinking about this logistically. But I, I want to know approximately when to expect uh, to see a particular species. Is it going to be March? Is it April? Is it, you know, is it June? And, um, and knowing that some of these birds, going back to my roots in New England, uh, starting to know a lot of the birds that either come there to nest, are mm. year-round residents, or just flying through, uh, I've learned that some of them will come up the East Flyway, and then once they get to northern New England or even just up into Canada, they'll make a sharp turn left and head over to Alaska from there. Oh, wow. Um, and so that blows my mind. Just, you know, wh yes. why aren't you going like on a diagonal? <laughs> like what, what, you know, what's, what's making you do it that way? But I'm in a place now where um, hundreds of species of birds come to nest. There's shorebirds and there's um, many duck species and, um, you know, the snowy owl, which is way, way, way up north, um, and other raptors that come here to nest. And these are bird species, some, that I would have seen in New England, but, but now I'm seeing them here. But it's also mm. a place where on day one, when my husband and I arrived here, we went for a walk towards a, um, a place called Westchester Lagoon, which is an IBA, it's an important bird area. And on day one, I was already starting to count species that I'd never seen before. And wow. it took me a long time as a birder to convince myself, my husband was a very instrumental in this, in keeping a list. I was never really a life list kind of <laughs> person. But this is an extraordinary opportunity. So I do keep a life list now, and I'm adding to that all the time. And, it, you know... As I said, I don't want to just know what the bird is. I want to know more about its life history. I want to yes. know where it's coming from and, and how long did it take to get here and by what path did you um, get here. So that to me is a very interesting uh, project to take on to help. It's going to help me. It's going to force me to learn the things that I want to learn, where otherwise I might just go, I don't have time. I have so many other things to do. Well, guess what? I'm going to make it a focus. <laughs> and uh, that's going to require me to do some extensive traveling, which relates to one of the blogs that I wrote about travel sketching. Mm -hmm. um, which shows my, you know, different kits that I use for different purposes. But uh, I intend for that to be, you know, I might start, I might be able to start doing that next year, but more likely I'll really start digging into it in 24 because these things take time to they produce. Do. Yeah. I love that project. I think bird migration is such a fascinating and rich and rewarding thing to look to look at and to think about and yeah because these birds do just sort of arrive and yeah. <laughs> and they've had this whole experience in, in another place and yeah. and to get to know that experience through research and through travel is is such an amazing project I can't wait to see how that unfolds yeah me too it's it's a little bit uh frightening I'm not one to spend I I'm I would I'm not a loner but I'm also not um, an extremely gregarious person. Mm -hmm. So the idea, I'm somewhere in between. I do really enjoy <laughs> my alone time, but uh, 
it's a little daunting to me to think that being on the road for, I don't know, maybe three months by myself, what am I going to do with all that time? Am I going to manage it well, or am I just going to fall apart and fly back to Alaska? Um, <laughs> I, I don't really see that happening, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting idea to me, and I'm grateful that I'm at a point in life where um, I can commit some time to that. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Sandy, it has been so wonderful to chat with you. Thank you for bushwhacking your way through this conversation <laughs> thanks can i can i make one request to your audience yes. go um, ahead as i said i'm currently uh curating the next cohort for this mm. uh field sketching year-long course and if you have if the idea of that interests you um, i would love for you to reach out to me uh, you can reach me at sandy at sandy um, and we'll go from there Perfect. I'll put all the uh, links to your uh, contact details in the show notes for this episode so people can reach out and get, and learn more. Thanks. Thank you so much again. Oh, Bethann, this was such a treat for me and I'm really glad that we uh, that we made this work. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Sandy. I love the idea of bushwhacking her path through life and career, and I've certainly felt this myself. Things are often not straightforward, and we don't always understand the way until we look back. It was fun also to hear about the ways that Sandy's Nature Journal has helped her explore her anxieties and come to know and appreciate her new home in Alaska. I invite you to head to the show notes for this episode where you'll find links to Sandy's website and social media, and also her email address, where you can contact her directly to hear more about her course, Field Sketching, A Year of Mindfulness. Thank you so much for listening. See you next week. Mm-hmm.